Welcome to The Stone Wolves, a Galactic Football League novella. Written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins. Performed by Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves is also available as a Kindle ebook from Amazon.com or as a full length audiobook from Audible.com. To find links for those items, go to scottsigler.com slash the stone wolves, one word. Nihao junkies, I am tearing along in Shakedown the Crypt, book one's first draft. I am 35,000 words into what is supposed to be a 100,000 word novel, but I'm already trending a little bit over that. Hopefully, I can reel everything back in the next few weeks. I have a June 1st deadline, which is a beast. The story seems to be going very well. I'm quite pleased with it so far. I'm really enjoying the first draft process. I put in a ton of time outlining and researching, and that's paying off immensely. But we will see how it goes as we move into the second two-thirds of the book. This is episode 31 of The Stone Wolves, and it all ends with episode 33. We'll have two Q&A episodes after that, so get your question about the crypt or anything else in the Sigliverse in to info at emptyset.com. That is I-N-F-O at E-M-P-T-Y-S-E-T dot com. We will answer the questions we get live on our weekly live stream, which we hold every Wednesday at 6 p.m. PT, 9 p.m. ET. So we'll do that in live stream, then we'll strip out the audio, we'll put that in the podcast feed. You can find links for our weekly live stream at scottsigler.com slash live streams. Oh, I forgot to tell you, if you email your question in to info at empty set and you want it to be a video question so you can see yourself asking the question on the live stream and see our live reaction, make sure it is a vertical video, vertical cell phone video. Make sure it is 30 seconds or less. Don't do any fancy editing. Just send in the video. We do that live stream every week on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can find those links at scottsigler.com slash live stream. Let's get you caught up on the Stone Wolves, and then we're going to encase a random smuggler in carbonite. Previously on the Stone Wolves. The killer flew a transport ship into Thorne's facility, shattering a window and exposing the facility to the barren wastes of MT-734. Fast fill sealed that massive hole, but atmosphere is still escaping through a growing hole in the roof. Thorne activated the Cruncher. The doomsday device's gravity warping field is starting to tear the facility apart, and it's only getting worse. The only way out is a semi-tractor trailer loaded with another cruncher that's inside the ruined transport ship. Can Aya and her team get that truck a-rollin' before it's too late? Find out next on The Stone Wolves, episode number 31. Aya slid past, ducked under, and hopped over the factory wreckage piled up against the sides of the hauler. Machinery had gouged huge holes in the hauler's sides, ripped off what was left of the wings after the hauler's plunge through the crystal window. She stepped down. Her foot slipped as it landed on the torso of a female Sklorno. No head, no legs, just the torso, still wrapped in shredded black robes. Perhaps the sentient had been blown to bits when Beans was in the Ursa Major Schmeck, or Perhaps she'd been ground to bits by the big hauler's dance of destruction. Nothing to be done for the sentient. Aya moved past, beans at her heels. A wind pressed at her, air being drawn out of the factory and the growing hole in the ceiling. We have to blast a hole in the fast fill, Skipper said, shouting to be heard. Blank, what weapons are on the EFT? Aya heard that new voice again the quith leader pilot shouting back. There was a point defense battery on top, but it was ripped off in the crash, the leader said. We have nothing. I reached the end of the hauler. The vehicle had carved a trench in the factory floor, exposing bare rock beneath. The hauler's rear ramp sloped down to that trench, both ramp and trench pointing toward the white wall of solidified fast fill. She ran up the ramp, saw the eco-suited leader standing there, 
holding a canvas bag almost as big as he was. Past him, the rear end of the 18-wheeler, cargo containers strapped down to its flatbed. Exosuits are in here, the leader said, shaking the bag. You, score no male, use the female suit, quickly! I and Beans scrambled up the ramp. Beans grabbed the bag. A flashing alert in her HUD. Peaches had the void cloak. Aya didn't know how to get the watchbot inside the facility. She tapped a fast command, told it to seek her out wherever she went. The EFT started to tremble. Wind whipped. Aya heard the faint sound of distant ventilation pumps pouring more air into the factory, a losing battle that was soon to be over. Gravity field has reached the p-p-p-prow, Bean said, as his tentacles dug through the bag. We only have seconds to get out of here. Skipper and Goldman came up the ramp next, Goldman's arm over Skipper's shoulder. Goldman looked like he could barely walk. Blank, you're driving, Skipper said, as they reached the top of the ramp. I am too small, the leader said. Goldman pushed himself away from Skipper. I can do it, Goldman said. I don't need my left arm to drive. Blank, give me that oxygen, Skipper said. Then wrap this man's arm to make sure his exosuit has pressure integrity. Beans, get that damn suit on, and you're on the back with me. Aya, get to the pilot cabin. Grab any weapons you find along the way. Then get back here. You have 20 seconds. Move. Aya did move, her battered body reacting to his bellowing, commanding tone. She slid along the truck's side, avoiding jagged, torn bits of hull. She had to move carefully, as the hauler was really starting to shake. It was too big to be pulled into the hole, at least for the moment, but that moment wouldn't last long. The growing wind pushed at her back, further threatening to throw her off balance. She reached the front of the truck, saw the yellow cargo container strapped to the hauler's deck. She tried and failed not to look at the dead quith worker on the floor, his helmet, and the head inside of it, smashed like a soft-boiled egg. She moved past, tried, and failed to not look at the dead human and dead warrior slumped in the airlock, holes in their bodies that their exosuit armor had done nothing to stop. The shaking hauler made their bodies wobble and jitter, almost as if they were trying to find a way back from death. Aya grabbed both of their assault rifles, slung them over her shoulder. She tried, and failed, to not look at the three bodies in the tight corridor leading to the cockpit. A human man with his head facing the wrong way. A human woman who had been bent in half, backward, and a warrior with a hole in his helmet visor, a hole that continued on into the wet cavity that had been his eye. Aya picked up the dropped weapons of those three, slung them as well, continued to the cockpit with her awkward burden. And in the cockpit, she tried and failed to not look at the dead key, its upper trunk ripped in half, flesh blackened by powder burns. The EFT rattled like a drumhead beneath her, making the key's soft vocal tubes flip this way and that. Skipper had killed all of these sentients, some with his pistol, some with his hands. The roar of a gunshot behind her made her twitch drop to a knee. So loud, audible even over the rattling EFT and the now slowing wind. The floor beneath her lurched as if she stood on the end of a diving board. Another gunshot. And another. And another. Aya! She heard the skipper scream. Get your ass back here! She snatched up the keys rifle and stood. As she turned to run, she looked out the hole in the cracked cockpit windshield, and the sight froze her in place. The hole was no longer a rectangle. It was an oval, widening as its edges were ripped inward as if by invisible water flowing over mud. But it wasn't mud. It was solid rock. Five odd meters of ground around that oval had been scraped clean, machines and bodies and detritus yanked into the black depth. The factory ceiling was like the underside of a 20-meter-wide crater, sheets of it angling downward, the bottom of it ripped away. Aya felt the pull of gravity, so strong she had to press one hand against the pilot seat, had to lean backward. A flopping chunk of crystal cockpit window ripped outward, 
spun once before it shot into the hole. Bits and pieces of broken things in the cockpit smashed against the front console, which started to fracture and break. The gun slung over her shoulders started to pull away from her, kept from flying away only by their straps. Aya! Skipper's roaring voice pulled her out of her daze. She pushed away from the pilot's chair, grabbed at anything she could to pull herself along. The guns strained against their straps, their weight threatening to yank her back. She'd frozen, like an idiot, and now she was going to die. She ground her teeth and took another step. And another. And the pull lessened, just a bit. She grabbed the hatch edge and hauled herself forward two more steps, felt the strange gravity cut in half, felt the guns drop toward the ground, toward the normal gravity, the real gravity. Aya heard more gunshots, Skipper's big pistol, and the sound of automatic rifle fire. As she stepped past the dead bodies in the corridor, she heard a great grinding and ripping of metal, the sound of a giant artificial animal dying. She tried to stop herself from looking over her shoulder. She failed once again. The front of the cockpit ripped free, ragged metal and whipping wires and sparkling crystal tumbling forward, smashing against the ground once, flipping and spinning, then it crashed into the edge of the oval hole, taking chunks of broken rock down with it. Fear consumed her. Maybe she screamed when she ran past corpses and into the cargo area. Maybe she didn't. She wasn't sure. She ran past the yellow cargo container, then past the truck, its engine softly humming, Goldman in the driver's seat, the top of the leader's helmet barely visible above the passenger side window. Aya ran along the edge of the flatbed, struggling to stay on her feet. She was almost to the end when the EFT lurched beneath her, sliding toward the hole, throwing her to her hands and knees. The ruined craft ground to an instant halt, catching on something, shaking like a tin shack in a hurricane. A hand grabbed her, lifted her and the guns up, dropped her on the flatbed. Start shooting, the skipper said. Red, go! Aya found herself at the back edge of the flatbed. Beans was there, a tiny body in a floppy exosuit four times his size, his little tentacle arms firing a rifle on automatic. Skipper flipped his orphaner, making the cylinder click home. He leveled his arm and fired again and again. Huge chunks blew out of the white wall. Beans's bullets blasted out head-size hunks of it, while each round from the orphaner ripped free a piece bigger than Beans. Aya dropped the guns on the flatbed against the back of the container. She grabbed one, started firing. The truck lurched backward, moving out of the shuddering EFT and down the ramp. Aya emptied her rifle, dropped it, snatched up another. She wrapped an arm around one of the cables holding the cargo container to the flatbed, then emptied that weapon as well. The truck thudded off the ramp, bounced, as the knobby tires easily managed the rough, shallow trench the EFT had gouged in the floor. She dropped her second weapon, grabbed a third. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw a skipper reloading his orphaner, doing it so fast his hands were a blur. He could load that thing and half the time it would have taken her to pop out a mag and slam home a new one. The truck rumbled toward the hole forming in the white wall. They didn't need to blast through it, she realized, just take enough of it away so that the truck's mass could punch through what was left. The wall came at her fast. She emptied her third weapon into the newly formed white tunnel. The holes made by the quith heavy rifle were almost as big as those made by orphaner rounds. A shower of white flakes spread out like slowly falling snow. The wind was gone. All of the factory's air had escaped. Hold on, Skipper screamed. I wrapped both arms around the cable as the back of the flatbed entered the white tunnel, the edges grinding against the sides, breaking more material free. Aya's body was thrown this way and that. She held on for dear life, pulling so hard against the cables She felt them even through her armor. In an exploding cloud of stiff white chunks, the truck punched through the other side of the wall and rattled across the planet's surface. She was thrown around even worse than she had been inside the EFT. Her arms felt like they were being ripped out of their sockets. 
Her helmet smacked against the cargo container. The truck slammed on the brakes. It stopped sharply. Aya found herself on her knees, her screaming arms still wrapped around the cable. Red, hold on and let us get in the cabin, Skipper said. Shuck that! We are going! Goldman screamed back. The truck lurched forward at full acceleration. As it bounced across the surface, rattling Aya's brains inside her head, she looked back and saw the reason for Goldman's fear. The factory was folding in on itself. No air to carry the groan of metal giving way, the snap of composite and plastic cracking apart. It was as if the factory wasn't a solid, but a gelatin, and beneath it, a straw, with God himself sucking in. The factory bent inward, flattening at the center, then all around. It shuddered and shook, and then it stretched, and in the blink of an eye, it vanished into the hole in the ground. A hole now fifty meters wide, a black funnel growing ever outward. Growing fast. Goldman, floor it, Aya said. The truck continued to accelerate. Aya tightened her arms around the cable, wrapped a leg around as well. To her right, Skipper did the same, one arm threaded around a cable, the other clutching the baggy suited beans to his chest. Early in life, Killian Carbonaro had been a devoutly religious person. Growing up wealthy in the Pierce Nation, that was a given. Later, when he'd lived in the Planetary Union and been exposed to far more cultures and views than his theocratic home, he'd still been religious, but his position had softened. There were many religions, and they weren't the low-one blasphemies that the mullahs said they were. As life moved on, and the number of sentients he'd killed climbed up and up and up, Killian hadn't known what to believe. And for a while, he hadn't believed in anything at all. That time had passed, because while he didn't know if there was a heaven, with his own eyes, he was looking into a gateway to hell. The truck hammered across MT-734's broken ground, bouncing violently, swerving left and right, as red wire steered around outcroppings and patches too broken even for the truck's big tires and high clearance. Red might pass out at any minute from blood loss. If he did, it was all over. Killian couldn't help with that. He couldn't slide along the side of the cargo container toward the front of the truck, because to move, to even relax his grip for an instant would see him thrown from the flatbed and onto the stone surface, where the growing hole would swallow him up. It spread like a puddle of blackness, like a living thing multiplying itself as it fed. An impossibility. Solid rock seemed to melt before it, chunks sometimes ripping free and flying in or being stretched like taffy, like Thorn had been pulled into the black monster mouth. He saw movement in the air, made out the running lights of the first EFT. It had come back, was halfway through its vertical descent to land where it had landed before, just north of the facility. As Killian watched, the EFT leveled out, then started to rise again. The ascent slowed, then stopped. The EFT was pulled toward the widening cavity. Killian saw the chemical engines flare, two long points of fire erupting from the ship's rear, but all that burst of energy did was keep it in place for another few seconds. Then the EFT slid toward the hole. At the end, the ship seemed to stretch out, to thin, as it broke into pieces that picked up speed, sliding into nothing and vanishing forever. The effect is stronger, higher up, Bean said. We're closer than the EFT was. It's not a sphere. It's like a, like a cone emanating from the cruncher. The deeper that imaginary cone went, the wider the hole became, a black circle of death pulling in all matter around it. The wider it got, the faster it spread. A hundred meters behind the truck, then ninety, then eighty. The truck wouldn't make it to the Oleron in time. Zan! Killian said, We're in trouble! Lifting off, Zan said. 
The EFTs left. I believe the skinless is preparing to evacuate. Move fast! He heard panic in his own voice, a sound he'd rarely made, perhaps never made. But this was an enemy that could not be bargained with, that could not be killed. The Cruncher was eating this world from the inside out. 70 meters. 60. Oh my God! I screamed. Oh my God! Killing looked at her and passed her. He saw the reason for her terror. A half click away, the ground rose, a new cliff, a kilometers long wall climbing into the air. At its base, spurts of orange magma, lighting up the rising rock wall and the ground beneath it. An instant later, along the entire length of the mountain wall that was already a hundred meters high, magma sprayed into the air, driven sky high by unimaginable pressures. The boiling rock lit up the landscape like wartime night flares. I won, Killian said. This is very b -b -b bad, Bean said. We can kiss our Hansel Gretel goodbye. The ground thundered, throwing Killian sideways. He felt bones in his wrist and fingers strain and crack. He lost his grip, started to fall. With beans tucked in one arm, Killian snatched the cable, dangled against the side of the flatbed, the impact hammering through him. He kicked a foot high, hooked his heel under the cable. The ragged ground rushed past, centimeters from his face, his shape a shadow in the light cast by the raining magma. The truck hit another boulder or ledge and bounced high, the momentum making Killian momentarily weightless. With hand and foot, he yanked himself back onto the flatbed, just as the truck slammed against the ground. Killian's head cracked against the cargo container. The cable. It was loose. Not disconnected, but not as tight as it had been before. The cargo container was threatening to bounce free. Killian tasted blood in his mouth. The hole. He looked back saw that the hole was only 40 meters away, a spreading, circular sea of pitch black. And somewhere far past it, the horizon lit up with an angry, irregular glow. In that far distance, a jet of magma shot into the air, a rocket ship driven by incalculable force. A spear of molten metal and rock reached up, kilometers high, before it bent back toward the surface, arcing into the hole like a rainbow of fire. Armageddon. Hell had come to MT-734, and it would take Killian and his family with it. Uh-oh, Bean said. We're out of options. Killian saw that Beans' eye stalks, loosely covered in their two big sleeves, were past the corner of the cargo container, looking forward. Killian did the same. Up ahead, maybe a half click away, a wall of magma sprayed into the air, a thousand meters high if it was an inch. He looked west, saw mountains collapsing, even as jets of magma rose impossibly high, fire tongues of hell stretching up to scorch heaven itself. Rocks hammered down, the cold magma hitting like bullets. Killian tucked himself over beans, felt the impacts on his back the intermittent punches of a heavyweight giving him jab after jab. The truck started to slow. Killian looked back. The edge of the sucking emptiness was only 20 meters behind. Red, shucking drive! We can't stop! We're out of road, Redwire answered, defeat in his words. Killian leaned out, looked forward again, saw that the still-rising sheet of magma was clinging to a new, jagged wall of rock lifting into the air. It was over. Either Red would drive into that wall, or the hole would take everyone down. Zan's voice in the combud, broken, full of static. I am coming in. No, Bean said. If you fly too high, you'll be sucked in. Killian felt a new sensation, a gentle pulling. The hole raced along behind them, inexorably closing in. No, it is, Zan said. Be ready to help me. We will only have one shot at this. Killian looked north to where the Oleron would be coming from. 
The wall of magma. It was too tall. If Zan flew the ship high enough to clear that, the gravity cone would catch her. But she didn't go high. Like a phoenix rising from the flames, the cargo ship splashed through the wall of magma. Molten rock trailed in an arc behind the ship, clung to the hull. For a moment, the fat-bottomed girl glowed as bright as dawn. Deploying crane, Zan said. Goldman, accelerate and keep your path straight. The Oleron, molten magma still trailing behind it, banked east and dropped low. It performed a tight turn, cool lava rocks raining down on it, exploding against the hull. Killian felt the tug of gravity ease off, just a fraction, as Goldman put the pedal to the metal. The circle, ten meters behind, still closing in. The Oleron hugged the ground, continuing its bending curve. In a bit of piloting that even Redwire would have admired, Zan brought the ship up on the truck's right. The crane rose from the top of the ship, swung over. The four long metal fingers spread, extended, and came down atop the cargo container, two fingers on each side. The fingers curled in and down and under, the last digits hooking beneath the flatbed. The crane lifted. The Oleron elevated and accelerated. Killian saw the top cargo hatch pivot open. The crane drew the truck closer. Killian felt the pull of gravity, strong, insistent, forcing him to hold tighter to the cable. The cargo container lurched. A cable had snapped. Ahead, a wall of magma. Beyond impossible in its height and width, a meridian of flame and fire. The Oleron flew toward it, climbed, and sailed over the top. The gravity eased. I have you, Zan said. Secure the truck, then get to the bridge. We are not out of trouble yet, and I need help. As the crane lowered the truck into the cargo hold, Killian had a moment to look out across the landscape, at the ground far below. MT-734 shuddered in the grasp of a nightmarish evil. The circle kept expanding, kept stretching, and the world flowed down into it. An endless chunk of tectonic plate, longer than a hundred mountain ranges, it tilted, started to slide into the planet, then the plate broke into pieces, split by the splashing, spurting, jetting force of the molten core being squeezed by the power of the universe itself. Below him, blazing orange light spread across MT-734. The entire planet was burning. The crane lowered the truck into the hold. The pie slice roof started to swing shut, chunks of cooled magma falling in like black rain. As soon as the wheels touched down, Killian called up what was left of his strength, of his leadership, of his will to keep those he loved alive. Blank, get Beans out of the suit. Beans, get the crane and truck locked down and get us ready to punch. Red, help if you can. Aya, we're needed on the bridge. Aya limped to her comm station seat, fell into it, ripped off her exosuit gloves, and slid her palms across the skins. Zan, Skipper said, plot a punch for Laura and get the carrier's coordinates up on the display. I lost it, Zan said. It seemed a lower priority than rescuing you. Skipper spun in his chair, faced Aya. Find it. We are going after it. Aya felt her stomach drop into her shoes. It's a warship, she said. With fighters? Are you nuts? What are we going to use against it? The two small missiles we have left? That's exactly what we're going to do, Skipper said. And if that doesn't work, we'll ram it. The carrier has three crunchers on board. If we have to give our lives to make sure this, he pointed out the windshield, can't happen somewhere else, then we will. He was willing to die to stop the carrier. He was willing to have Aya and Beans and Zan and Goldman die as well. Aya looked through the window. The Oleron had reached orbit and had leveled out. The world below them burned orange like a tiny sun, a planet engulfed in fire. 
If there had been anything alive on that surface, there no longer was. If it had been Yal or Ionath, or Tower, or even Craterach, all life would be gone. Had other planets died like this? Had entire civilizations been wiped out? Perhaps in whatever galaxy the Abernasi had left to come here? Find that carrier, Skipper said. Now! He spun again, stared out at the horizon of fire. Skipper was right. The carrier had to be stopped, no matter what the cost. Aya went to work. It was a mental escape, a brief moment of relief in losing herself in her skill set, of embracing something that she was better at than almost anyone. Her hands touched, circled, spun. Sensor readouts flashed above her station. She did a hundred things at once, processing ship transmissions, scanning all frequencies for the planet's heat and light radiation reflecting from orbital objects, grabbing panicked chatter from the fleeing tourist vessels. The planet is losing mass, Zan said. We have to punch away, now. The skipper looked to the ceiling, as if Zan was there, not hidden in her hold. Red lines flared on his face. Exo, that carrier has three of those bombs on it. We have to destroy it before it's too late. It is already too late. Zan's voice remained perfectly calm. The planet's mass, it is reducing. We have 22 seconds for punch-in, or we will not be able to punch at all. The red lines on Skipper's face dimmed. That's impossible, he said. I am aware of that, Zan said. And yet it is happening. In 19 seconds, the mass of MT-734 will shrink below the bottom margin of the punch ratio. The nearest planet with suitable mass is Laura. At relativistic non-punch speed, it will take us three years to reach it. Fourteen seconds. I went cold inside. All her pain, all her shock, suddenly distant things, thin echoes of what they'd just been. With no punch anchor, the Oleron would putter along. There could be no rescue, either. No ship coming to her aid, as punch-capable ships needed a place to punch out. They would be trapped here. The Oleron supplies would not last three years. The crew would eventually starve to death. Ten seconds, Zan said. The red lines on the skipper's face faded out completely. Once again, he was just an old man. An old, tired man. Past him, beyond the crystal window, Aya saw the planet of fire. What Zan said was impossible. None of this made any sense, and yet it was happening. The planet looked smaller. Eight, Zan said. Skipper pressed the all calm button on the captain's chair's armrest. Beans, are we ready? Seven, Zan said. Six. Good to go, Skipper. Four, Zan said. Skipper released the button. Zan, get us out of here. By Aya's count, they had one second left when the reality wave swept over the bridge. You have been listening to The Stone Wolves, a GFL novella. Written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins, performed by Scott Sigler. Follow Scott on Twitter and at Instagram, where he is at Scott Sigler, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves was directed by A. Sigler. Engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2021 Empty Set Entertainment. Theme music is the song Battle Cry by the band Super Weapon. 